I know what I'm getting. I'm like, yeah, I've been to India before. I've visited family. I can do this. Oh, no. You know a country and a culture once you live there. Come to the Global Indian Podcast, the world's greatest journey and the official platform for people of Indian origin. Because let's face it, we are everywhere. My name is Raja Nazran, and on our weekly show, we plunge into the human experience of being a person of Indian origin, take a closer look at the countries we now call home, and tackle the issues you need to know more about. This is the world's greatest journey that will ultimately change the way you see the notion of Indianness to be, and importantly, our connection to each other. Every week, the team and I are joined by our guests, where we have open conversations about the 50 shades of brown that is our experience, and take a closer look at the issues close to their hearts. Now, in this remarkable conversation, we travel all the way down to the freezer of the world, that is Canada, and we meet with a, a marvellous documentary maker called Amisha Joshi. Now, to give you a bit of context to this conversation, we've all heard of the legendary female boxer Mary Com from India, from the grass to grace story that she is part and parcel of. And you've all probably heard about the movie, the Bollywood blockbuster that came out, with her name, looking at this story. But 10 years before that, there's one woman called Amisha Joshi, who on a whim and seeing a photograph of female boxers in India, decided to take the plunge. And she traveled over on a shoestring budget and spent over a decade, over 10 years, filming, documenting the story of this group of women in this part of India who are pursuing a career in boxing. She happened to also have in that documentary the woman who is now famous, Mary Cumb, before her fame and fortune. And so the documentary that she created is a true reflection of what female empowerment and female boxers go through within the country. It just happens to be that the gods of fate kind of decided upon the time that she was releasing her movie that also the Bollywood blockbuster will also be released, which is a bit of a shame. But it also gives us an, a glimpse into the perseverance of this remarkable filmmaker who took on the greatest challenge of her life, who dedicated over 10 years of her life in terms of empowering and showcasing the true story behind the female boxers of India. And importantly, for us as an audience, to learn about her remarkable story of perseverance and why she felt the duty and commitment to follow through. Like always, if you'd like to find out more about the Global Indian series, you can find out more at the end of the podcast. And as always, this podcast has been supported by our dear friends at ShareMe.com, the app for all your fitness, wellness and beauty needs. You know the score by now. You've been listening to the podcast. It's the 27th episode. Until we speak, I hope all remains well. I hope you thoroughly enjoyed this episode. It truly is a fantastic one. Get up and just move. Get up and just move. started off the film, you started off the documentary, 10 years on, you've got this body of conversation that accurately records the lives of not just women in India, but athletes, women that are going out into box. You, you almost shattered all those stereotypes that many people had towards them. And it also recorded this life journey of a woman who's now incredibly famous across India, Mary Kong. But you did it at a time that her Success was noticed, but not noticeable across India, let alone internationally. But you're almost, to me, the unsung hero of that, because when nobody else was flying that flag or fanning the flames of publicity, you, along with your colleague, spent 10 years, a whole decade, going back and forth to India, living the experience, sitting there, going through or running out of finances, trying to get money in, a real dedication to actually showcasing this. So I suppose the question is, again, what's it like for you and what did this whole thing mean? Mm. 
Um, for me, it's very satisfying that the film finished. Oh yeah, I mean, we, we were um, like working on no funds. We had run out of our, you know, Canada Council money or, you know, arts funding that we had and we stretched every dollar we had because it took us 10 years and we had so many production trips, like four to India, two to China, one to Barbados for a world championship. And the team actually even came to Canada. So, I mean, over those 10 years, we stretched every single little, you know, dollar as much as we could. But, um, so like what it, it was a, a, it was a huge relief that the finish, that the film actually finished. We had 200 hours of footage and everyone just kept telling us, well, you can probably make, you know, 30 different films from the footage you have. And it's like, no, you don't understand the one thing we were missing during the making of this film was really good access. And access is key as a documentary filmmaker when you're making character-driven film. And we did not have that. So we would go to India, just pray and hope that they would let us into the boxing camp. And we lived alongside the boxers, as you mentioned, for months at a time. And, but they train like militant style, like hardcore, six days a week, three times a day. And you don't get in the way of their training. So we would just, we had so much training footage by the end of this. And we had very little, we were like, it took us forever to figure out who our characters were gonna be, what our story was gonna be. Like we had to figure that out as we were going there and shooting and making this because all I knew was that, whoa, these women are phenomenal and nobody knows about them. I have to make a film about it. And then that's not enough to make a film. So, you know, we naively went in 2006 into Delhi when Delhi was hosting the next world championship and we yeah, we got them winning they were crowned the championship team title they were the number one team in the world they got this much mention in the times of India cricket was splashed everywhere even though the team was performing terribly at the time anyways all that to say um yeah I think like I just really I just wanted to share these the stories of these women around the world because I thought what they were doing was just phenomenal and people needed to know about it. And uh, yeah, I mean, they, they taught me a lot. Like even now I kind of think about, I think about them, like, you know, if, if times are hard or difficult, they always had this term that they would often use, you know, you know, we were living in these circumstances where the water would shut off and, or electricity would shut off. And this is, they were training, it was monsoon when we went to visit one time, and so 45 degree heat, you know, and you don't, forget AC, the fans sometimes weren't even working because the electricity would cut out, and they would never complain, and they're training in this, and like, and it, it was phenomenal, and they'd always say, oh, we'll adjust, no matter what, we'll adjust, there's not enough rooms for us to sleep in, we'll adjust, the food is terrible, <laughs> it was terrible, it was unbelievable the circumstances in which these these athletes were, were living and training in, like any kind of like, if you comp compared them to like the cricket players in India, it was a stark difference. Like we've got footage of Mary Comatter home after she won the, her third world championship. And like, she's just this humble girl on the floor cooking vegetables. And it's like, you see her home, it's very like, simple you know and um you see how these cricket players are living and being treated like gods and i understand it i understand the popularity of cricket compared to boxing but um even within the boxing world the indian women's team was constantly outperforming the men's boxing team yet the males boxing team men's boxing team would always get more funding and better facilities and they would they would like laugh at the girls or like well, where is this going to get you you know like what do you what are you doing with your life? And, you know, and again, the film is entitled with this ring. So it's a double entendre where yeah. these girls were of the age where they should be getting married, but they're choosing to pursue a life of, pa of, of their, their passion, which is boxing. Yeah. So, I mean, I just felt so good to finish the film and it just felt so good to get the film out there. Honestly, I was kind of hoping we would have more success with distribution, but that's a whole other game. Like as soon as you're done your film, your work begins. And no. believe me, my tank was empty after 10 years. So I had to pull deep to try and really get this film out there. And you know, I did the festival film circuit and I had like, this is my Sundance moment. This is my Tribeca moment. This is, no, it didn't get into any of those, any of the A-list film festivals. And the boxing film had come and gone because everyone and their dog started making a documentary film about women boxers as soon as the Olympics announced women's 
the, like it was going to become, um, there will be a women's contingent in the sport. In the summer games in the Olympics, it was the last sport that was missing a female, uh, you know, contingent, I guess is the word. So everyone, all these documentary filmmakers just jumped on it. So there was like a billion female boxing documentaries that we saw starting much later than our film, finishing much earlier than our film, getting all this attention. And that was, we were happy for the filmmakers, but it was painful. <laughs> That must have been hard though, right? It's it's tough because it's, I suppose uh, coming back to it, when you got into this, had you made a documentary before or was this your first? My first feature. I had done shorts in film school. Yeah. But no, and I was like, oh, I, I know what I'm getting. I'm like, yeah, I've been to India before. I've visited family. I can do this. Oh no. You know a country and a culture once you live there. Yeah. Yeah. Then you really see the ins and outs of, of the workings and you, yeah, you get into the deeper layers of what it's like to live there and be there. Yeah, well, was... we're talk, talking about the deeper layers, again, I remember you said before when we spoke that what inspired you was looking at a photo of this female boxer in India. And that's kind of what kick-started your own thought off. But even before that, you didn't come from a filming background. You, you were working, you were in a UX designer, you're doing incredibly well. Then you thought, actually, I've got a deeper yearning to do something different. You know, almost like that woman who said, what if? And so you gave up on the shot of love. You gave up on the shot of everything to kind of become back a poor student at university studying filmmaking. And then on the back of that, if that in itself isn't remarkable enough, you thought, I know what. This photo has caught my attention. I'm going to go up to India and pursue this. Like your, your own life is almost a mirror of a thriller for anybody else's type of movie. Now, what is it that inspires you? What is it that made you want to do this in the first place? Well, you know, I think um, ever since, you know, I was young, I definitely was more of a creative artistic person. You know, I would, I love drama and writing and creative writing and, uh, you know, writing screenplays, but like all like as a kid when I was young. And then I kind of put it aside. Like it wasn't, I am not blaming my parents in any way, but I mean, it wasn't something that was encouraged academically. Like I went to school and I, I had no idea what I should do. And I actually purposely and very consciously stopped writing poetry and stopped being creative and thinking, okay, this is a waste of my time. And I was like, I know I've got to get find a good job and get on that career path. And like, you know, I, I guess deep embedded, it was, you know, be successful as, you know, a lot of proud parents want their, their kids to be. So uh, I was not, I did not have an aptitude for math or business or engineering at all. I hated those things in computer programming, but I had a psychology degree and at that point the IT industry was really booming in the early early 90s and so you know we all landed jobs in the IT industry I was a UX designer and that actually is a branch of psychology so I did that for seven years and I was just in that making good money I was in my 20s I was young living in good places like life was great but yeah that did everything turned around i remember i went to see a psychic and she said you're going to go back to school and you're going to be very financially strapped and i was like oh this psychic is bad i'd like my money back please but whoa she was right on the money so that was when i had actually moved to halifax nova scotia i had this beautiful view of the ocean a corner like office had my own team had a you know it was amazing but then the it industry crashed i lost my job I'm in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and if anyone knows Canada, that is not a booming city by any means. It's not a metropolis. So there was no jobs after that. And I mean, I wouldn't, ha I had too much of an ego having been um, a manager of a UX, to be a UX designer with a managing team, to go and, and do what I thought was like, you know, more menial job. So I was like, I just didn't work and I was down and out for too long. And then, but while I was there and while I was in the industry, I just sort of took randomly just took a community college course on introduction to super eight filmmaking. So super eight filmmaking, it's, it's, I don't know if you're familiar with super eight film. So back then everything was shot on film, cut on film. 
and it was very old school. So I, you know, I shot my, I shot a film on the Super 8 camera. I edited it myself, like literally cutting and pasting it together. And I remember I was doing this and it was like really late at night and I was cutting this film together. And I had, we, they had located the space above this bar in Halifax. And it was, I could hear the, the bass just going boom, boom. And I was just like all night long as I was editing this film. And I just remember having this epiphany, like, oh, this is it. This is it. This is what I love. I love more than anything. This is what I want to do. So when I did lose my job, I was like, what am I going to, what am I going to do? Because I also had the realization I didn't love my job. I mean, it was just dragging my feet to work every day that you don't even know you're dragging your feet to work anymore. It's just your new normal. And yeah. then I thought, okay, yeah. And then I, um, yeah, I decided to, there was one film school I wanted to attend. I applied, I got in with uh, the short films that I had made when I was in Nova Scotia. And it was really tough because I was so in love with my boyfriend at the time. And I knew that if I left, it would mean, it would mean a breakup. And, uh, but yeah, I just knew I had to, I knew I had to. So I drove my car that from Halifax to Montreal and it died in Montreal. So I think that's like where I was meant to be. It's like, okay, no further. This is where you're supposed to land. Yeah. And then that year was rough, I'll tell you. And I, and I definitely had my doubts, like, what am I doing? I'm 30, back in school with 20-year-olds. And I had no money, and I was eating oatmeal every day. And it was winter, and Montreal's freezing cold, and it's minus yeah. 45. And I couldn't even afford a bus pass at that point. And I was walking everywhere. But I was strong as a bull. Oatmeal and walking everywhere will keep you disturbed. That's yeah, it. Should. It's a breakfast and lunch and dinner of champions, apparently. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, uh, sorry, I, I can go off on a long uh, trajectory sometimes. So I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm there, I'm in it somewhere, you know, but it's like, I think what it is, what was fascinating is the fact that you're a person of Indian origin, you're Indian. And then what you chose to do was with the documentary, if, if we take away the idea of borders, you took, you look to take on a discussion that nobody else would ever touch, which is, Here's a part of society that we all too often brush over. And here's another subcategory of a sport that we don't normally have a sensical idea towards a certain gender web. So you thought, well, I'm going to do that. And as you said earlier, it's like you produce something that is remarkable because I have the privilege of watching parts of it. And you kind of think, surely that should have been your swan dance. You know, that's it. This is a moment. This is a breakthrough. And then you see a movie that comes out, and no disrespect to the movie, but it doesn't have the gut-wrenching feel that this does. It doesn't delve into the human experience that this does. And this is 10 years, Amisha. Mm. 10 Are years, it's like, that's like, that's a considerable amount of time for anybody's life. Now, yes, we can be positive in the way that we spin this, that this is the, this is the earmarking of you. This is a foundation cornerstone of who you now become. But during that time, you realize a lot about yourself. You realize a lot about others. And I think you also realize a lot about what these podcasts is, which is about this notion of Indianness. So here's something that's curious for me. Did your notion of Indianness change over that course of time of making this documentary? What did it mean to you at the beginning of what it means to be Indian, this loose identity? And then what did it turn into? And what were some of the biggest injustice that you thought, actually, this is something that we can no longer stand for as a community. Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting because I'm definitely drawn to India and my culture. And if I compare myself to like my cousins and my sibling, we all grew up in the suburbs outside of Toronto. I'm definitely one that, you know, is enticed by it. And I keep going back to visit India and I'm, you know, just wanting to roll around in my culture. So I am drawn to it um, for reasons which, I mean, I mean, I, I know why I'm drawn to it. It's just a fascinating, it's a fascinating culture, not to sound so cliche, but like anyone who goes to see India the first time, it's, you, you feel the depths of its history. It's a bombardment on the senses. It's just, it's a fascinating place. There's so much energy everywhere you go, everywhere you go. It's just layered and rich and in it in every in every way so i mean i'm fascinated by the place for that reason but my indianness it's interesting you bring this up because i would go there 
And it was like something that I had struggled with, not struggled with my whole life, but there was always a sort of this uncomfortability around it because my parents are Gujarati. So I can understand Gujarati, but I could never, I don't speak it. And even if I try, like my tongue can't make those vowel and consonant noises like the rest of us. So when I do try and speak it, everyone just, they don't understand what I'm saying or they find it hilarious. But so the fact that I didn't have the language made me feel distant from it, but I yearned to speak the language. But I think there was something psychological in my head that thought it is so difficult for me to learn a language. I don't know, people are like, why don't you just, why don't you just learn it? And I'm like, that is a, a, a huge task for me to learn another language. I'm pretty much unilingual. Like I can manage in French because I've been in Montreal so long, but you know, my whole life. So my parents, when we go to see other Indian people or when I would go to India with them to visit family, they'd say, oh, they understand everything because it's, I could tell. I mean, I don't know if they would admit this. My feeling was there was a little bit of embarrassment on their part that I wasn't that Indian. Like, I didn't know what to do when you go to the temple with the arti. I'm like, is this the right direction? Or I mean, like, I don't know, all of it, you know? And I just felt like an imposter in some cases because I was so unfamiliar with it. And, but wanting to be familiar and seeing other people that were there and just like, oh, I wish I knew how to do things and how to dress and how to put on a sari and how to make chapatis and all, all of it, you know? But I, I yeah, I, um, I don't. So I always sort of felt a little bit in and a little bit out, like drawn to it, but then not fully part of it. And I mean, I just, I love the Indian languages and I love like most of it when I was there, people were speaking Hindi, but the way they communicate in Hindi and the little expressions and like, I, I'm, I'm so drawn to it and I love it. And I wish I could express myself that way. Uh, but it's not in me, but I'm like trying did, to did learn. That, did that yeah. change over the course of 10 years? Because I can imagine being there you have a bit of a vise, everything's this cherry red color. Then you're there and then you see how things can go wrong sometimes and you can, you have to deal with the new, and this is any country in the world, right? It's even here in the UK when I'm back here, it's like, oh, well, when I'm abroad, I really miss the UK. When I come back, it's like, yep, I remember why I kind of <laughs> took the leap. So did, did your sense of Indianness change along those 10 years? Um, yeah, probably, yes, it did. Um, up to the point where, because I became more familiar with just being in India, traveling in India, and, um, you know, my friend and I, we were both women, and we were young, and we would travel everywhere, like on buses and trains, we stayed in Delhi, we would go out to eat at night, and like, I felt very comfortable in India, where people from India were like, what are you two doing? You do not go out at night alone, especially in Delhi, like, Delhiites were telling us that. And um, I, it's not like that, but to answer your question though, like I, you know what I, I did, yeah, I think I just became more comfortable with being in India and you just pick up, you pick up more. Did I become more Indian? Hmm. Or did I feel like I became more Indian? Well, I mean, how, yeah, how I, did it shape your notion of Indianness? Because mm, now, do you have to be in India to feel Indianness? Well, you felt that before. Did it give you another, almost like a 3D, another feel for what this ancestral home may mean to you? Or did it give you another sense of identity? Because if we look at the documentary, the documentary is fantastic and it deserves the success out there much more than what it's achieved so far. And I'm sure it's going to come. But the interesting thing is you, as a human being, this person who took on this journey, hand holding the, the thorns of the ball. And you plunge yourself over there at a time where you have a lot of misconceptions about India. Women's rights, are you going to be safe? Oh my God, you're a Canadian girl going over there. Is something going to happen to you? Are you going to be taken advantage of? And then what? Well, you're going to these remote areas. And are you going to be kidnapped? Is something else going to take place? Is something to take advantage of you? And then you're coming back to, the, to Canada and somewhat changed. Something must have shifted or this sense of belonging, this sense of wanting must have changed. I feel like this is my Jerry Springer moment, isn't it, man? It's like <laughs> no, I, I definitely do feel, yeah, through the course of this, sure. And honestly, I hadn't really thought about this until you really brought it up. But I think there's no question I feel more of a connectedness um, to being Indian. But I think, you know what, but I was somewhat fully formed by the time I went there. You know, in India, I was like, yeah. you know, probably in my 30s. 
So, but what would happen was what would get amplified was how I wasn't Indian and how I was Indian. So, you know, these little subtleties of um, Indianness, like things that I'm proud of in terms of how you treat a guest, you know, like someone comes, stays with you, you know, they have this term, a guest is like a god, which I love. And so like, there's nothing like Indian hospitality. I'm sure, I'm sure there is, but it's one of those countries that has wonderful hospitality and very genuine. Um, and we got fed wherever we went. And it was just very, very, um, people are very warm. And, um, but then, so there's little subtleties like of, of, you know, how you're Indian and, you know, you're definitely kind of little things. Um, I don't know, like, there's no question. You take your shoes off before you enter a house. There's just, I don't know, little things like this. But at the same time, how I wasn't Indian. Yeah, I think I, I didn't embed maybe some of the stereotypes that you would if you grew up there on how a woman should be or be living or what's expected of her. Um, yeah, and I found that, um, yeah, I was, I was frustrated with the level of patriarchy that was there, you know, and um, I'm trying to think of some specific examples for you, but no, I mean, it's terrible. I mean, just little things like how a woman has to always kind of be aware of how she's, how she is all the time and appearing, coming across as loose in any way, if you're dressed a certain way, if you're sitting a certain way. So you have to kind of watch yourself all the time. Because that's, that's something that's spoken about in the documentary, isn't it? That they said, well, you can't box in the Savar Kameez or Saudi. You have to wear shorts and a t-shirt, but yet you have all these thoughts that go against you for that. Yeah. So I suppose, mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that. And it was very interesting at the time in India because, um, you know, it, it, uh, you would see, oh, India is so progressive that you looked at the movies and then you'd see how people were dressing, women were dressing, and you'd just see, you know, you would see how they were in the movies. But then, no, it's not like that in real life. So the fads on a superficial level, India looked like it was progressing very fast. And when change happens in India, it happens fast. But the mindset of the people, well, that's ancient, and that hasn't changed. Even today, when I went there, and I, I recently just came back from Bombay, which I think is probably the most open-minded, progressive place in the whole country. And even then, you know, it's still, it's got a long way to go in terms of um, I, I progressive mindset. I mean, I, I- How do you feel your documentary challenges that? Because, again, I, I suppose it's, the reason I keep on coming back to this is because it really is a powerful thing that you created. I suppose if we take away the essence of boxing and we look at it, a documentary of people's lives over the course of 10 years, then you start to see the shape of what India really stands for or the progression or the changes or how we have to mold into these stereotypes. You know, the lady said it towards the end, you know, my parents could see I was getting very stressed with boxing. So they said, well, why didn't you get married? And now she's wearing a wedding ring and she's showing it to the camera and you're thinking in so many different ways, wow. Yeah, I mean, she, it's like she had no choice. And I mean, I, she never came out and said it and you can't come out and talk about this in India. Um, and we don't know. So the bottom line is I don't know their sexual orientation. And although I definitely suspected that some of them were not interested in, or at least a married life, you know? But, and then we would see and hear from over here, oh, all these boxers were getting married, having kids. You know, they, Mary and Sarita, two of our characters managed to have kids and continue to box only because their parents became, or their husbands became stay at home dads. And they were completely the home maker. And they had, they had very smart husbands because they realized, okay, we're married to some of the best boxers in the world. We'd be stupid not to let them box. But, um, but yeah, but like with, uh, yeah, like with, with Chotu, it was really sad actually to find out she got married and we never met her husband. We didn't meet him. She was just a very independent person that was like a lone wolf who lived by herself. And, but she loved boxing so much. Like you would ask them because, you know, after a certain age, you're like, well, what are you going to do after boxing? And you could tell they didn't even like when we asked that question. They would like, they would, they would answer around it because they can't see their life without it. 
and they all have like all the characters are staying within the sport as coaches if not like mary's still gunning for 2020 the olympics whenever that's going to happen but and and sarita's gone professional so i mean they're still at this age unbelievably like still in the sport um but um what was sorry to answer your question again should i go off on a trajectory and i forget where i wanted to come back to so um yeah and i think that i was i think that it was really sad for me to see that these women couldn't live the lives they wanted to live they had to live a lie i mean they couldn't even tell us that how they really wanted to live i mean these women were not going to come out on camera you look at india now i don't see two women who want to be married living together it, they would be so shunned and ridiculed india's got a long way to go long way to go in terms of like is, is it <laughs> india or is it also the indian nurse has a long way to go because at one point we if you look at india we just had a podcast earlier this morning actually with Ila Arun, and she goes if you look at where hinduism was right at the start the woman chose her husband not the other way around now it's changed now all of a sudden things have shifted into this it's the patriarchy, but it was never like that. If you go into Punjab, where us guys are from, it was a very open liberal society. But it's changed. These, these aren't traditions. If we go by the adage, is, traditions is a democracy of the dead. Well, that means it's a recent dead. that have kind of created them for these ideals. But you're, what do you stand for, Amisha? Um, well, I think just justice and equality. And wow. I was, well, I mean, it was so frustrating to see these women that were working 200 times harder than everyone else not getting the recognition they deserved. And so- but you, but you must have seen something in you that sorry in others, because that's, I don't, know, I don't know if I'm going too deep here, but typically <laughs> you, you, when you notice something other people, it's because you've felt that frustration before, you've seen that before. Well, I think I probably wanted to fight against it all like they were. So I was just sharing their story because, you know, like they, they were so bold and brazen and unapologetic and seemed to be thick skinned about all of it to pursue what they wanted to pursue. But, um, yeah. And I think that, uh, I mean, but what, was, were, what were you fighting against? Hmm. Well, I think also like I'm, I'm not a traditional person um, as well. Like, you know, it, it really wasn't that important for me to get married and have kids. Like you think it's important because it's drilled into you from a very young age. But I mean, even now I wrestle with it a little bit because it's so ingrained in me. But it's like, I have to remind myself I'm fine. In fact, I'm very content. Um, yeah. And I'm not, cause I'm not married with kids. So, um, and I'm lucky enough that my parents are open-minded. They're not your typical traditional Indian. I have, I have Indian uh, friends who get literally asked every day by their mother, have you found someone? Are you looking for someone? You know, every single day. And it's funny, the other day my, my mother asked me, uh, so when are you gonna get a boyfriend? You know, like she would love for me to be married. And I know that if I was, her mind would just relax because then there will be that man taking care of me. But I don't know. My experience in life is that that's not going to give you comfort to find a man to take care of me anyways. Um, in fact, you know, anyways, that's a whole other topic. But like for me, like a relationship, it's, I mean, you got to be in the right one. Let's put it that way. I and mean, many of us have been in the wrong one, you know, and mm. um, it's anything but comforting. <laughs> so it's actually very, very freeing to, to live alone. And so one of our characters, Chotu, when she, you could tell she didn't want to get married. She's like, no, I don't want to get married. She goes, so, like, it's going to time me down. Because the moment you get married as an Indian woman, huge chance is that you are going to have to quit the sport, stay at home, take care of the family, take care of your parents' family and cook. And there's nothing wrong with that if that's what you want. But they didn't want that. Their raison d'etre, their reason for being was boxing, and that will never end. That's just, a, it, it, was just an, it, was, it was crazy what a passion that they had for the sport. So, yeah, I think that in a way, them rebelling, I wanted to show them rebelling because I'm not a rebellious person. I don't like to 
uh, cause rifts. Uh, I would never argue with my parents. I would do whatever they wanted to be that good daughter. But I'd still go about and live my life the way I was living it. But, but, your, but, your, but your medium of choice is through filmmaking, through documentary making, telling those stories of how one can rebel, how one can rise up and make a difference. And almost you, and, but you did that as well, Misha. I guess you, you did rebel in the sense of what people's expectations are. You did what every, any sane individual should do, which is question, how much more deeper is this human life? What more can I do? Can I, can I look beyond the curtain, the veil of tradition and say, what's this beating heart in here and can I follow it through? Because surely that's a life, right? Yeah, no, and you know what? I mean, I was definitely challenged making this. Like when I first started making this film, like my family in India, like I would tell them what I was making and they would kind of go quiet and look down <laughs> because for them, they're like boxing, like my, and like, at the time, my dad was even like, Misha, this isn't a sport. It's violent. It's just violence. And he's like, there are so many beautiful things in this country. Why are you focusing on this? And then now that the film finished and now that it came out, now Mary Comb is a sensation. I mean, it's very nice to have them be very proud of me. But uh, it didn't start out that way. I don't remind him of that. It's fine. It's okay. But, you know, it wasn't the case in the beginning. Um, yeah, so I mean, I had to have be very resilient in knowing that, and I knowing that I had a, a good story. This is the thing with with this ring is I never doubted it. I never, for what no matter how, what I was up against, I never doubted it. I'm like, no, I got something here. These girls are phenomenal. I'm making this. It's gonna. Uh, there's nothing like it at the time. <laughs> yeah. So, even, but I think even now, even though that there have been other documentaries made as well as a movie made, I think it's fair to say that there is nothing like this because it is 10 years. And even if, it, even if we did it as half that, five years in the making, five years, there's, we don't do that with anything else, do we? Everything's almost very instant. Look, okay, coming back, because I know we're skirting around certain subjects, so it's fine, it's all right. Coming back, it's, do you have any frustrations now? Oh. Well, I mean, well, not, I mean, now I'm not frustrated anymore. I think, you know, you live and you learn, but I was very like, even now I kind of wish, oh, I wish it, it, it reached more people. I mean, the film is available online right now on, um, and I mean, people can watch it, but you need promotion. There's so many films that are out there. And so it's just, it's just a matter. And we're so done with it. Anna Sarkissian, who is a co-director and the cinematographer for the, the film as well like I think after we actually worked on it for more like 12 years than we did 10 and I think afterwards we were just like so exhausted and so burnt out and um so almost traumatized by the incredible amount of work that it was because it was really just two of us doing everything we had an editor at the end we did have an editor and that was just like a saving grace but like yeah. it was incredibly hard to make this film and we we didn't even have any assurance that we were going to finish it or we even we didn't even know like we were coming back on the plane after our last shoot in 2012 and we felt like okay i think we might have just enough to make a film it's after 200 hours of footage because like i said majority of it was training and other things and there was so little time that we had with the boxers one-on-one -on -one interviewing them because they had one day off a week and that their one day off was our day to work and do they want to sit in a hot room when we have to turn the fan off to do an interview? No, they want to go shopping. No, they want to go out. They want, you know, but so like we had to like negotiate these little windows of time to talk to them, try and find time to go visit their family. For Sarita and, and Mary, it was, it was in Manipur. Uh, Chotu is from Haryana. So like, we, you know, we had to organize all of that very hard. We had very, very small amounts of time with them. And going to Manipur was difficult back then because foreigners, we're not allowed entrance in it without special permission. So, oh my God, it took Anna and I like forever to get that special permission. We'd wake up every day at 4.30 in the morning, stand outside the Ministry of Home Affairs, like for the paperwork for like for two weeks. And then we were staying with, um, at, a, at a hostel where the couple was from Manipur. And he actually had some connections. He's like, are you two still, you don't have the papers? And we're like, no, we're going every morning. And he's like, hold on, he makes a phone call. 
And then the next day we go back, we go to see this woman in this room from Money Pouring. She signs our paper and we get it. It's like, this is how things work in India. You know, it's all about yeah, yeah. connection. But anyways, all that then going a little off topic, but um, yeah. Uh, so, so do you feel it? Did you feel appreciated for doing this by the boxers or by whoever may be out there? Because you, <laughs> it's ten years. <laughs> I can't get over the freaking name. When ten, you're telling me Rajan actually is twelve years. Twelve years. Yeah, you know it's funny. Um, for some reason, I didn't have that expectation from the boxers. I didn't have expectation of the boxers to be appreciated for it because they were just going about their lives and we were capturing oh. it. And even my friends would be like, well, why would they be upset? You're actually helping them. And I'm like, ah, oh, but at the same time, you know, as a filmmaker, like you're not, they're not asking to be filmed. So you're yeah. really at the mercy and you're just kind of hoping they let you tell their story. Um, yeah. And then, you know, it took them forever, forever to realize what we were doing. Like it was in 2012 when we last filmed them at the last champ championships, which was the Olympic qualifiers in China. They gave us like, India team jackets and they're like you're one of our you're one of us now and it's like okay it only took six years you know but and we're done now we're done <laughs> so um yeah it, it was uh it was tough but appreciated yeah I mean of course I I mean I learned the hard way about um your film will get exposure if it's trending if it has a big name like Mary Comb is big in India but that wasn't big enough for us to get open doors here and we would go to film festivals and I'd see these films, these documentary films that I didn't think were as strong as ours being let in and winning awards. And it's like, our, yeah, so it was really, really hard. I really had to fight to get, um, to, to get our film seen. So it really played in a lot of the second tier film festivals, like a lot of the South Asian film festivals, which I realized at first I was like, oh, you know, I'll be honest. At first I was just like, oh, anyone can get into those. But then my tune changed because I go to these South Asian film festivals and I love them now because it's like, oh my God, they're celebrating me because I'm South Asian. They're supporting South Asians. It's all South Asian films. And I was like, it was, I love them. I love them so much with all my heart because they have so much heart and they give you so much attention and it's real. Whereas if I were to go to like a, a bigger film festival, like even TIFF, I'm sure I would, I don't know. I've never been to TIFF, so I can't say, but, or, you know, a bigger film festival like Sundance. That was the one that I wanted to get in so bad. We paid so much money to get in. They get like 10,000 entries and they choose like, a dozen like but I had to try you know but yeah so it was so heartbreaking the distribution of the film and then like getting it online because distribution for films anyways I won't bore you with all that but it is changing every day yeah. so I mean it, it was it was it was tough yeah it was on Amazon Prime in India for a while but Amazon Prime like the way they work is um, they can decide to take your film off at any time without any notice they're sort of the perfect example of corporate evil <laughs> but everything is on there at the same time so you know if it's on there it'll get seen you know so right now our film is on a platform called seed and spark which is idyllic in terms of its ethics its morality its treatment of filmmakers but no one knows about it so um it's one of those things so uh and honestly, like Anna and I are just so done with the film like I remember I was trying to get Priyanka Chopra to tweet about it I remember I was on that forever and I, I managed to get someone who knew her stylist and the stylist sent her an email and she read the email and then, but it, and now she's so big and married to Nick Jonas. So forgot about it. So anyways, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I just, I, I still think, yeah, it would be kind of nice if the film had another, maybe a surgence or could be made popular somehow, but. Um, what's, yeah. what's next for you? Oh, so um, back to India again. <laughs> so I guess talking about Indianness, now you're definitely onto something because I keep getting inspired by uh, ideas from over there. Because believe me, as a filmmaker, it is complicated to make something in India as opposed to as just a simple idea in my own backyard would be like a gift. But um, yeah, I started, I was there in, in Bombay for four months, starting a new project about it was originally just going to be again women 
actresses who are trying to break into the film and television industry in Bombay? And what is the climate like for them right now? Because, you know, Me Too has happened, all this has happened. And I'm like, what's it like right now for a woman in Bombay? And so I went and it was worse than I thought. Yeah. So, I mean, in terms of what they have to deal with, because, um, I mean, everyone's like, oh, well, you know, this, referring to things like with the Me Too movement and, and all of, you know, what women have to deal with, people are like, well, you know, it's in every society, it's everywhere. I'm like, it is, it's, in, it's everywhere, but I feel it's worse there in India. And the stories that I heard firsthand, um, pretty bad. So, uh, but then I, would then I was really focusing on just the women. But then I started interviewing some of, or just talking to some of the men, like really like struggling people. Like there are people that come with stars in their eyes every day from outside of India to Bombay and they just tr try to make it. And um, a lot of the men encounter the same kind of problems and um, shadiness in the industry as the women do. And a lot of the men said, oh, actually we have it worse than the women. And I'm like, oh, well, I'm not sure about that. Maybe, I don't know, but it's, Either way, I found it's very interesting to hear from the, just the men and what they go through. And again, like, I think boxing was something that I couldn't understand. Like, I was not at all interested in the sport. It was always about the women behind the sport. And again, with acting is something that terrifies me. Like, so I'm fascinated with people that want to get up there and make themselves. It's, you're so vulnerable when you're acting. So I think about, the, again, the strength of character it takes to become, to be so vulnerable. But again, they just, they love the craft so much. And I, I just find the whole world kind of fascinating. And again, like these, there are people that just go for auditions every day, every day for years and they never make it. And it's so sad. It's kind of a sad story too, but it, yeah, it was quite fascinating what I found out while I was over there and how um, the colonization hangover is alive and well in India. Cause I met some uh, girls from, Canada and the US uh, there were and they they would land and they would just get showered with opportunities and they were struggling back in Hollywood in LA but then they would come to Bombay and they were just like I mean well they had the right look but I mean they were getting all the jobs and they didn't know Hindi and like is that a problem they're like no they'll just say they'll dub it and then I would talk to these Indian girls uh, very pretty Indian girls who were like talented and they said yeah, sometimes my Hindi is a problem because it's not perfect. I'm like, oh, interesting that your Hindi is a problem, even though you have a, almost a mastery of the language, but these girls who don't know it are, are getting opportunities left, right, and center. So anyways, yeah, so back to India again. That's, so. that's really, really interesting because it says, what's fair? Should we take a second look at the industries that house our attention? And if so, if we really want to be the social custodians, if we're ready to virtue signal at every moment that's been possible, are we ready now to do more than that? To have a look at the industries that we support by attention and say, what if? And can we change that? Can we change the narratives that come in? What a fantastic episode. I'm sure you agree. It's incredible. She's so humble, down to earth. And I, for one, cannot wait to see what the next documentary is going to be on. You know, it's that these actors are in India. If there's anything to go by with the current movie that she did, With This Ring, and you can check that out at www.withthisringfilm.com. Oh, man, you're going to be in for a treat. So, as promised, if you'd like to find out more about this epic adventure called the Global Indian Series, it could not be easier. Have a listening on your platform of choice, so whether it's YouTube at our page, which is a Global Indian series, or if it's by Podbean, which is globalindian.podbean.com, or even if it is on Facebook, you can find us at the Global Indian series, or on Instagram at the Nazrans or the Global Indian series. On either platform, all you have to do is simply like, subscribe, share, comment, and importantly, share your story as well. We'll love to hear from you because ultimately, together, we are building a living encyclopedia about our community worldwide. This couldn't be even more important than ever before, especially given the current circumstances we are in. So until next week, I hope all remains well. I hope you remain safe and happy. And importantly, if you haven't already, make sure you do check out the film. 
She's done a sterling job, and I think she deserves the ban of positive publicity. Take care. Speak to you soon.